Well, let's get started. Um, my previous, uh, the, the previous speakers set up what I want to talk and what I will talk about very well. Um, Eva's talk uh, mentioned heterogeneous, heterogeneous data, integration, uh, provenance, data discovery. Uh, Joe talked about um, things that, the close, uh, that are close to my heart, metadata, ontology, semantic web. He talked about SDF for data representation. I'll talk a little bit about RDF for metadata representation. Um, he talked about, uh, he mentioned this, uh, if you uh, do research, you should be able to explain how you got the, the answer. That's about provenance. I'll briefly mention that thing. Russell mentioned when a user can store data and share at their own option, that talks about access control and things of that nature. So, um, uh, I, and I want to mention the, the number of uh, uh, the colleagues like TK Prasad, who is in the audience that um, work with me on some of the things I talk about, and uh, a number of students, including Kalpa, who is in the audience. Um, I'm at Ohio Center of Excellence in Knowledge Enabled Computing at Wright State University. Um, I think we are probably the largest uh, uh, academic research group in semantic web in, in US. So I'll talk about uh, semantic technologies for big science and astrophysics. I know we are more focused here on solar terrestrial physics. Um, and uh, I had anticipated that there will be a discussion on uh, big data per se, or there will be dis discussion on volume. Already the previous speaker mentioned uh, uh, a good bit about that. Um, I'm actually going to talk more about the um, challenges posed by heterogeneity by the complexity of the data. Uh, that is because um, I've been giving talk on big data also. Um, uh, this, uh, this year I'll give three, give three keynotes on big data. And one thing I noticed, we talked about this volume, velocity, variety, uh, 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 and, and things of that nature, velocity. Uh, the com more compared to the volume issue, the harder issue to ch uh, solve is um, the variety issue, the heterogeneity issue. Because at the end of the day, I think we human beings are more complex. And that um, understanding what the data is about, that it requires um, uh, human involvement, as opposed to just the volume issue where you can throw the resources at solving the problem. <coughs> so the challenge uh, that I want to address is how can we handle a vast, heterogeneous, complex data uh, uh, related to space and, and uh, physics and other things of nature. I'm not a domain scientist here, so, but I, uh, we constantly work with domain scientists. We do constantly work with uh, people of other discipline. And computer science, as just talking to Marek uh, a little bit about it, is that we become um, indispensable service discipline. Uh, you do any, uh, you do biology, you do uh, life science, you do clinical sciences, you do geosciences you do need computing. And that's where uh, I think comp without computing, new discoveries cannot be enabled. And I'll focus on these complexity issues, right? And the question is, can semantic or semantic web technologies ease the challenges and empower the scientist? So very brief history of semantic web. Um, the term was mentioned in a book by Tim Berners-Lee in, um, uh, in 1999. And he emphasized the significance of metadata about the web documents. And there was a well-known uh, uh, paper they had in 2001 uh, about World Wide Web in Scientific American. Um, about the same time, actually, I had started a company in 1999 uh, that uh, was about use of semantic uh, technology and semantic web data for web search. Uh, and we actually had a patent award in 2001 uh, with a commercial product already out in 2000. So my association with Semantic Web does go uh, way back. Those are the name of the companies. Um, I will, let me, in case, uh, I, I assume that not everybody is familiar with Semantic Web, so I will make a very quick and a very high level introduction. And so I usually say one, two, and three about Semantic Web. Number one is about agreement uh, and about the knowledge. So uh, the agreement is that ultimately uh, we get to understand anything by, let's say, language. So we communicate through language. But we have shared interpretation uh, through the understanding of natural language, and that's why you're able to communicate. That's why you're able to understand what I say. Same thing is about data in general. So uh, we need to have agreement. That agreement is captured in 
variety of form. It can be a simpler form of vocabulary or nomenclature. For example, there is a very well known uh, so-called ontology, which is not really formally an ontology in computer science context, uh, called Go ontology, gene, uh, gene ontology. It can be conceptual models, it can be domain models, it can be full-fledged ontology in higher knowledge representation fr uh, uh, framework. Another very important thing about anything is, um, uh, you know, uh, is the knowledge, factual knowledge. There are certain things that are known as truth, and you capture them, and once you have captured them, cod codified them, computer programs can understand that. And when the new data comes in, they know uh, what the things are about. Right? So typically, they codified, you codify this thing as schema and factual knowledge. This is essential for interoperability because now we can have common interpretation. It is essential also for automation because now computer programs can be made to understand what those, that data means. Now, creation of these ontologies or, or knowledge and all that can be a manual process. For example, we created a very compre comprehensive ontology for complex carbohydrate. And that took a couple of years working with the domain scientists, with the uh, biochemists and such. It can be semi-automated where uh, we can um, create, uh, we, uh, programs can analyze the corpus of the data and then um, you can, uh, you know, uh, have the scientist uh, validate it. For example, we created an ontology for um, cardiology, cardiovascular disease and so on and so forth. We go through clinical documents, find pot potentially new facts, uh, organize them, rank them, and uh, present it to uh, the uh, domain science, uh, you know, the clinicians or others uh, to say whether this is a valid fact. If so, incorporate that into, uh, uh, into, into uh, the ontology. And it can be a fully automated process in certain limited cases. The second part, uh, the second aspect of one to three of semantic web is metadata or semantic annotation, meaning annotate the data or uh, describe the data using metadata, right? Or it's also called labeling the data. Simply put, you have a document, you have a piece of data, you label it, you tag it. Now, uh, think about images on Flickr. How are you going to uh, search image on the Flickr? Only way you are able to search images on Flickr or any of those things is by using some tags. You search images on Google. How are you searching image on Google? You are typically not giving another image. You are, uh, you're not drawing the image per se, although the people are working on those things. Typically, you describe the image. Uh, you can type in noises, and you'll get image for noises, uh, a, a, an icon for noises, right? So ultimately, so that is tagging and annotating. And basic, the important thing to recognize is that this is not a simple process. But here, there is a significant role of the item number one, the ontology, the nomenclature, the vocabulary, whatever you had. You use those terms to tag the data, and you have whole form of type of data. You know, type of data. You have images, you have video, you have data in all different formats that the previous speaker talked about. You need to figure out a way to typically automatically or semi-automatically tag the data of all the kind. But now I have once I have done that using that common vocabulary terms, I can get my unstructured data, uh, you know, textual data. I can get my relational data, I can get my file in a certain file format, I can get image data. They all use, were tagged using common term, right? So that's a powerful way why, uh, why uh, tagging is so important. That's important. Uh, the third is the use of this vocabulary as well as the use of this metadata for a computation. You might use the word reasoning, you might, and, and ultimately this is the um, core of the application. Applications utilize the data in one way or another. You may have simpler applications like searching, finding the data, discovering, browsing, integrating the data and collaborations. Uh, or you may want to analyze the data, find pattern, you call mining, hypothesis validation. And finally, you might have even more complex uh, you know, interactions with the data, uh, query question answering, like IBM's Watson system, um, or, or making our Apple CD system or making connections and finding paths and supporting discovery and representing more complex representation, right? So again, you want to be able to describe all the uh, domain knowledge and understanding. You want to be able to uh, tag the data. 
And then you want to be utilize all that uh, tagging uh, for an application of the kind. Now, um, <clears throat> a couple of pictures that talks about abstractions. The term abstraction is very important. Um, we've been talking during the break about uh, how do you, um, uh, you, you know, there's so much data being created and the previous, uh, uh, you know, uh, speaker also talked much about massive creation of petabytes, petabytes of data. In 2008, we lost the capacity to store all the data that we generate, right? And only 0.5% of all data gets analyzed today. All the, what, what happens to all the rest of the data? Given that we can't store all the data that we generate, and only 0.5% of the data gets analyzed, what happens? Right? What has to happen is something that you are all doing right now. What are you doing is um, a process we call semantic perception, a process called perception, um, uh, whereby uh, the, all these bits hitting your brain, right? Uh, this is gigabyte of data hitting you right now in terms of video, in terms of text you are looking at, in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, voice and, uh, but ultimately you are translating all that data into few things that you take away, few things that you will remember, right? This is called perception. Cognitive scientists have studied for a long time. So the point here is to go from data to syntactic data, and I've given examples there, you can just briefly look at them, to structural representation, to semantic representation, and then ontologies. The point is to move along this particular you know, uh, 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 dimension. Let me give you an example. You're faced with the data 150. That happens to be raw data, which is actually just a number. But that number is given a label that it is a systolic blood pressure, right? And now you can represent that in a format called RDF, resource description format, it's a World Wide Web standard. And then you say that is an elevated blood pressure. This is the interpreted data, right? You deduce something from the data. Uh, it is elevated blood pressure. And, um, Yet, they recall, uh, you know, if you are a physician, for example, you will not prescribe the data because it is a, uh, an elevated blood pressure. Because elevated blood pressure could be because of hypothyroidism or it could be because of thi uh, hypertension. And the medication for each of them are different, right? So you have to convert that into an interpreted data. In, 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 this may be called abduction. So uh, I won't talk about the te computational technique that we use on the right-hand side here. But nevertheless, the point here is that this sort of thing. There's also called DIK, uh, W, uh, data, uh, information, knowledge, wisdom uh, kind of uh, 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 axis. All right, with that philosophical underpinning, uh, semantic web in practice today is about uh, creating ontologies to create, uh, capture domain knowledge, uh, having the language to represent the uh, knowledge as well as the metadata and the data. And so there are worldwide web standard for um, a uh, representative of knowledge or, or ontology is called OWL, the web ontology language, and for representing the metadata called RDF, a resource description framework. Then there are frameworks for uh, open sharing of the data. So there's something called linked open data. You want to give it later, further? Um, and in the link open data, uh, the, the basically this is a framework where uh, people are able to publish uh, the data in an open framework and then people are able to search for the data. So there's a large bubble, bubble of data out there on the web. Um, this so-called open government uh, uh, data uh, is an example of uh, the uh, use of uh, this link open data techniques for government data, per se. And um, so there are now hundreds of bubbles out there. For example, geonames, all the names in the world out there are you know, published in this format. And it is uniformly accessible to everyone because it uses the standard thing. And then you annotate, you do search, you do browsing, you do provenance. These are all the variety of techniques and technologies that are to support them. Now, interesting thing here is that this thing is being widely uh, used in certain disciplines and other disciplines are lagging. Um, uh, in the biomedicine, for example, there are already over 300 ontologies. Uh, and government, particularly in National Institute of Health, uh, has funded um, uh, centers in those areas uh, in the in biomedicine, and that has allowed for creation of these large reusable ontologies. There are quite a few applications in healthcare. Uh, I am working with um, uh, ADHF, uh, acute decomposite heart failure. I am working with uh, asthma, with GI, with um, uh, elderly care, and keeping patients home. And in all of these, 
uh, semantic sensitivity technologies are being used. And there is growing use and exploration in geoscience, although uh, there's a lot more that is to be done. To make things more concrete, I'm going to take example for, um, from a couple of uh, projects. One is a project that um, uh, I observed when I was recently, uh, I was recently on sabbatical and I was visiting EPFL in um, uh, Lausanne. Uh, and uh, there they have an excellent project, very well funded project, um, where physicists are actually, and computer scientists are working together, particularly astrophysicists, uh, uh, for shared vocabulary creation, annotation of documents, browsing uh, the, uh, the documents through related concepts. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I may borrow, uh, uh, you know, but don't, I won't talk about in detail uh, about the work that we do in uh, healthcare and life sciences that uh, encompass uh, collaborative research, prototype, open source tools, ontologies, deep, if these involve uh, deployed applications, commercialization, all that. Uh, we have uh, technologies taken from our research has been commercialized uh, several times over. And then I'll talk briefly about material waste. This is uh, one of the projects that we have related to materials genome initiative, and where I felt that there is a, a good bit of analogy of what this community can use. Um, again, I have to learn more about it to be sure, but as best as I could tell, uh, there is a thing. So let me start with the science wise. WISE uh, stands for Web-Based Interactive Semantic Environment. So it's an interactive and crowdsourced tool to capture knowledge from scientists' daily routine work. And uh, so its core consists of a community that builds this ontology, or basically is vocabulary only. And then literature gets annotated and bookmarked using the ontology. So for example, here is how that, uh, that ontology looks like. You can see, um, you can go to sciencewise.info. And uh, uh, it's a nice graphical interface, and um, uh, uh, a scientist is able to propose a new term to be incorporated in this uh, vocabulary. And then others, uh, there is a, a process for community to uh, agree and then incorporate that into uh, for future use. So it becomes part of it. Similar to gene ontology kind of thing, although gene ontology it, the process is far slower than uh, the process that works here. Now, once they, um, anything is part of this uh, ontology, uh, more uh, in, 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 principle, in reality uh, vocabulary, then they have tools to be able to annotate a data. In their case, though, the data seems to be limited to uh, scientific literature, the publications. Um, so any publication that uh, a scientist comes up with, uh, they themselves or other scientists would use this vocabulary to annotate that. And they can then, other scientists can bookmark, search, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, effective document reuse, but particularly scientific literature use. Now, many of you are aware that there is equally uh, the fast growing work in reuse of the data itself, meaning that you just don't want to limit to the uh, text in, let's say, PubMed, but all the data that went behind the uh, publication are also, so there is data science index also available, and so there is a corresponding work that is going, uh, going on with regards to the raw data itself, the scientific data, experimental data itself. For example, there may be a conclusion based on mass spectroscopy based uh, work, uh, right? So mass spectroscopy is ma large amount of data, just the same as um, a ph a physics creates large amount of data. And so that data can also get annotated. For example, uh, we had, when we had developed that uh, ontology called glyco for complex uh, carbohydrate for glycan expressions, then they had a workflow where uh, science, uh, scientists would start with uh, cell culture and then work through seven, eight, nine step of workflow. And in the process for single run, in that case, they would create five gigabyte of data. I'm talking about several years ago, so that was a pretty large amount of data at that time of time. But that data was processed in multiple different ways. For example, there'll be software that will uh, you know, uh, analyze spectra. And then it'll uh, c get ma M over Z, uh, mass over, uh, you know, so that is a particular parameter, just the same way in your community, there'll be parameters of the same nature. But as the data is processed, we will tag that data and say this particular number is M over Z. Just the same way you saw in the previous case, there's hypertension. 150 is uh, you know, blood pressure, right? So that, that gets done automatically. And then it is totally searchable. So at the end of the day, when you have a conclusion, you can ask the question, tell me information about the cell line from which these experiments were run, right? So you go several steps back and get, this is called provenance, right? So science-wise is, uh, uh, you know, doing just that. 
value proposition for uh, what I think for this committee is that associating machine processing semantics with scientific engineering or engineering data and documents can help overcome the challenges associated with data discovery, integration, interoperability, all these things caused by heterogeneity. All right. Um, now, um, challenges that you have are, are all well known. Uh, I listed these things. Uh, previous speaker talked about it. We want, I think that uh, this committee will need technologies beyond science wise, which is a wonderful uh, uh, project. Uh, we need to go beyond uh, the scientific publi uh, publications I already mentioned. Uh, we need to have data sharing um, uh, with the credit. We need to have provenance and access control. Um, and uh, we need to have framework to capture, search, and discovery, discover all these kind of data that you're going to have. So the nature of data and documents in this thing is going to look something like um, what we find in material sciences. Because this, this example is from material science. So you can see data in a whole variety of form. Uh, you see relational uh, tabular data. You see um, uh, regular tables, uh, you see publications, you see figures in publications, there are images, you have XML, XML documents, you have technical specs, all these kind of data are there. In dealing with all that, you need to have, you have several challenges. So you have challenges of granularity of semantics. Um, for example, you have all kinds of synonyms. Uh, I'll give you an example. There are some examples given here. I'll give you an example from a very interesting domain. We work, recently did work with uh, uh, another of president's initiative on prescription, prescription drug abuse. And um, um, uh, we are analyzing uh, web forum data on uh, use of um, uh, you know, uh, drugs uh, that people abuse. So they are opioids. And so for one, every one uh, occurrence of buprenorphine, which is one of these uh, uh, opioid antagonists, uh, there are 29 occurrences of synonyms bup and whatever other things there are, right? So this is going to be there in almost any community. So the ontologies and that process uh, takes care of capturing of those kind of synonyms. There are other things like co-references and broadening and narrowing of the meaning. So that's why you have to create these hierarchies. And there are other uh, things you have to capture. Uh, for example, you have to norm capture the normalization uh, uh, that might have been done. Um, and, and you might have to capture a whole variety of uh, characteristics that might be related to your data type, like uh, the solution heat treated. These are the terms, uh, specific things that have to be captured in your thing. Now, there are broad variety of approaches, and there is no one size fi uh, that fits all uh, uh, requirements. So uh, there is a um, uh, lightweight semantic approach where you have files and document level annotations to enable discovery and sharing of the data. There is a deeper uh, semantic and rich semantic approach where you have uh, data level annotations and extraction of semantic search and summarizations. And there is fine grained semantics approach where you uh, have data integration and interoperability. So the point here is that uh, if I simplify somewhat, um, you can deal with the like document as a whole thing, or you can try to understand every term in the document, every word in the document every image in the document, every caption in the document, every reference in the document, right? So there is a whole variety of solutions that are possible. And again, it's up to the community to decide what level of um, uh, uh, you know, uh, solution they want to have. Uh, having worked with many disciplines, uh, in our case, uh, we have developed uh, tens of ontologies. Large number of them are open source or they are used in commercial applications. Uh, I would say that, um, uh, it is important to have um, quicker, uh, uh, it is important not to be dogmatic and not to take an approach that will take millions of dollars and uh, five years before you can actually show the results. Hence, uh, typically I tend to uh, recommend or suggest to most uh, people uh, and uh, you know, people in applications that take the lighter weight approach rather than uh, trying to be so, you know, try to capture the whole knowledge of your domain into a logic framework as an, as an example, right? So um, there are, um, all right. So um, in the context of cyber infrastructure, again, the use of um, uh, semantics 
comes out at, uh, at the level of crea creation of these uh, control vocabularies and ontologies, annotations, and then other things like uh, provenance and extension that I talk, I'll talk about. So we had uh, proposed a lightweight semantic based approach for, um, uh, uh, for geosciences. Um, and uh, uh, we, this particular proposal got pretty good reviews, but uh, it got submitted to uh, um, uh, cyber infrastructure and then uh, program manager was changed in the middle uh, uh, before the results came out and then he said that, no, you have to have two domains, not one. So they did not find any um, uh, proposals in that domain. But nevertheless, I think the approach that we had is very interesting, I think valid, in that um, the series of tools here that, um, uh, if I may just kind of mention what kind of things goes into the guts of it. So you have a um, uh, variety of you know, data, you have the ability to annotate of this variety of data, you have storage of the metadata, you have the ability to browse the metadata, you have the ability to search based on the metadata, you have the ability to get the documents that you want, you have the ability to docu uh, search a more, uh, I don't see this, all right. Uh, we are ability to search, um, uh, you know, do more annotation of the data, uh, and so on and so forth. So, whole variety of um, uh, tools that can help uh, the scientists uh, have access to the data and metadata all, all through the web-based tools. All right. Uh, in the genome uh, uh, work that we are doing, for example, we have this MAT vocab homepage, and it just kind of shows a series of applications. Here you can see uh, there is an application for um, uh, 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 visualizing the knowledge base, you can see here. And the ability to uh, create um, uh, more vocabulary, so there is a collaborative vocabulary creation. Uh, then there is the ability to uh, create annotations semi-automatically, uh, so you have a data or document and it will show you all the annotations and you can accept it. Then those annotations get indexed and they become searchable. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so you can do search uh, for all your data and discover, uh, uh, discover them. You can do also more comprehensive, uh, you know, you can query the vocabulary to see whether certain terms are there or not. And then you can also annotate the processes. And there's more that are coming in this tool set. So um, I think we kind of generally understand these things. So just to show you an example, in this case, uh, there is a document, and you can see um, uh, the terms that are in the uh, vocabulary or uh, ontology that get um, uh, annotated. Now the interesting thing here is that you can kind of right click on any of these uh, highlighted term, and you can see how they are described in the vocabulary ontology. And then you can um, uh, potentially, if you want, you can also browse in context. So you can go with this term, you can say in the ontology, this term is associated with other terms. Show me other documents that show, uh, you know, uh, things uh, that are related to this term with participating in certain relationship with other documents. So there are a lot of things that you can do things about it. The other issue, one, one in important thing, uh, and again I mentioned that previous speaker also talked about provenance, um, that you want to explain the origin of an artifact uh, such as what was, uh, how it was created, who created it, when was it created, and uh, for, for example, given uh, material X, which processes are involved in making the material and what are the relevant performance properties. And you can see a whole bunch of stuff uh, that people want to know. Um, in your domain, I'm sure you have about the same kind of stuff that you want to know. Uh, you know, there will be different details of it, but again, uh, what machine that you had used, what, what telescope you used, what were the setting, where, where was it pointed at, who, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? You want to capture that. In fact, in many of the scientific disciplines, if you don't capture this provenance metadata, then the reuse of the data becomes very hard. If the data is created by two different processes, by two different machines, and you don't know, uh, you know the tolerance and all the other different specificity, it's not possible to combine the data as an example. And um, you know, there are tools like, in this case, we have, we have a tool called iExplore, which can capture the provenance metadata. So in this case, you can see something called generic PMC uh, uh, prepreg uh, is subjected to this generally, uh, generic hand layup and so on and so forth, yields something else and so on and so forth. You can see this process uh, that can be uh, visualized. 
Um, here you can, uh, uh, when provenance comes, when vocabulary comes from multiple places, in this case, they have this uh, Mill Handbook 5 and uh, uh, Mill Handbook seven, uh, um, uh, 17. So here one of them, uh, one of the description of this concept called A basis comes from one of these and other comes from the other of them. So you want to be able to know how those terms actually came into being and that we adopted and what are the different interpretations of the same term itself. And you can, uh, you know, de uh, demonstrate those vocabulary, um, you know, um, uh, term and, uh, you know, definitions and the source of those definitions also as you uh, look at the data and the rights of the usage of the data. For example, uh, in the, uh, in, in material science, this, uh, a, uh, there is ASM, ASTM, they own the uh, rights. Uh, uh, Gelu, how much time you have? Oh, so you want me to wrap up? All right. Uh, so um, in the case of astrophysics then, uh, you would also want to have, and in many other disciplines, you also want to have uh, access control. Let me just mention last thing here. Uh, so uh, you have data of uh, many, you know, from many sources and um, different people own the data. Um, one of my first thing I did after my, my own dessert, uh, PhD was um, uh, something called federated databases. So the idea here is that, uh, you know, people who created the data uh, have the ownership and they are able to um, grant the access to data uh, uh, on selective basis. And so you can describe, you know, private data, selectively shared data, public data, and so on and so forth. And then you can create this co called federated architecture where grant, you know, data right access can be granted and there are you know, tools and technologies for that, so I'll, I'll bypass that. All right, um, so let me bypass these details here about uh, you know, uh, the federation and uh, about the access control. And there are a number of tools, uh, there are demos, uh, if the slides are made uh, public, you can look at this, them too. So then let me give you the takeaway, my last slide. Use of semantic web technologies can help overcome challenges associated with data discovery integration, interoperability caused by data heterogeneity, use of provenance and access control can help share exchange data more reliably. So rather, rather modest goal, but uh, is, uh, something where I think semantics will play a very, very critical role as we go along. Either I overwhelmed or I was absolutely clear. Or you guys are already exhausted. Eric. Uh, well, science-wise, I mean, you know, that's, uh, you know, the people are in, you know, French and uh, English and such, but um, no, I don't see anybody who has dealt with um, multiple language issue in the ontology context very explicitly in any formal way. Uh, I, I believe that here, though, in this particular community, practically all that they are interested in for some time to come is in English. So I doubt that there would be major issue right here, and the challenge is, will, there are plenty of challenge to be address in English before we get to the um, scientists needing data uh, uh, with queries in different languages. So, but yeah, it's, a, it's a valid qu a question. I don't, you know, it may not be one of the high priority questions in this domain. Vincent? So I, uh, that problem uh, we have to we had to address in our material science project, anyways. Um, uh, so this is um, uh, an example I showed where um, the um, vocabulary terms uh, have um, uh, appear 
in two different uh, highly used sources. So these are very, very uh, critical sources in uh, material science, Miller book five and uh, 17. Both of them give uh, definition of this term, right? Uh, but uh, they are very related, but not exactly the same. And so you really have to um, classify them. Uh, you really have to record them. There's nothing much you can do. These committees have uh, uh, you know, existed for years. And uh, I don't think that uh, uh, you know, either you have um, a government agency or somebody uh, you know, uh, uh, say this will be the standard, or you go through World Wide Web or some other standard body and say, let us create a standard in that context. Or you say, well, this is what we have. Let us uh, continue. And that's why in this one, uh, we will even show the provenance of vocabulary. And, and say where that uh, interpretation came from, and what interpretation did you use? So uh, it becomes, uh, you know, complicated things. You can handle it. We do handle it. Um, uh, if you can create, um, the point is that uh, reaching uh, agreement among human is one of the hard, harder things to do compared to a lot of technological solutions that we can come up with. Humans, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you were trained to use all your life using this particular thing. I mean, just the thing, you know, see, you, know, you, ca you can't change, take the United States from metric uh, to, to metric system, right? So, so uh, the, change, the thing that you've grown up with all this time and you ask them to change uh, how they call something, well, they, that, that is hard. So you record your agreements and disagreements in precise ways and move on. But you can do that technologically. We can support that and that is a reasonable way to go on. So for example, if I find occurrences of two terms, uh, same term in two different contexts, I, can, I might have techniques to actually say whether they are exactly the same or they are related, that one appears to be a subtype of another, things of that nature. And that's what the ontology alignment is about, where there are two different kind of ontologies, but the, is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, tomato and tomato, are they same or not kind of stuff. Um, most of the work that I have seen have, has not done that, but technologically it is eminently doable. So, uh, uh, meaning, um, you know, there is a lot of work in, uh, you know, temporal data representation. And, uh, for, you know, ultimately whether I have vocabulary, ontology, all, it's all some form of data representation by itself, right? Rich form of data representation, knowledge representation. And in that, if I want to capture um, evolution, uh, I would. I will give you a very concrete and interesting example that goes, dates back to my uh, uh, 1999 company. Uh, we used to uh, crawl sources of knowledge, and one of the sources of knowledge, we, we had so ontology for news, which included polit politics. And we had a concept in ontology called the office of the first lady. And there, um, uh, you know, uh, in 1999, the office of the first lady was uh, you know, occupied by um, uh, Hillary Clinton. And then we crawled again uh, after 2000 election. And um, uh, the, that had changed. Uh, so uh, it was uh, Mrs. Bush uh, who occupied that office. So uh, at one point of time uh, in the ontology, uh, the f knowledge, the fact was, uh, you know, Mrs. Clinton. And then uh, the, the, the fact had changed uh, in the knowledge base. And so uh, attuned to that time frame of 2000 election, uh, there was a change in the information that can be recorded and that was recorded. And then um, because we are supporting search and somebody searches for, uh, you know, first lady, uh, if the document happens to be before that, you know, uh, time uh, ch change in that knowledge, it has, you have to use that interpretation. After that, you have to use 
other interpretations. So indeed, um, there are um, uh, you know precedences in dealing with this kind of stuff. It is technologically doable, uh, but uh, it I would caution that it increases the complexity of representation. Every time you do that, ultimately again, uh, you are, for ontologies you have just like we have ontology browsing tools. Um, you the users are humans and the users are so software programs. Complexity of both increases, so you need to be mindful of what you want to do, how much complexity you want to manage. With that complexity comes, you know, you have to maintain that knowledge base in a consistent, consistency of that knowledge base is another thing. So we keep on adding layers of complexity and sophistication, whether we want to do it or not is a question we have to make, um, you know, as opposed to technologically things, yes, it can be done, but as I was saying earlier, that yes, we have ability to create this highly uh, rich ontologies, but that will take many years for people to potentially even uh, come with the agreement as opposed to uh, we are doing this weak, uh, uh, you know, lightweight ontology, we take the terms from existing dictionaries, ASM and ASTM, and just make it part of our ontology and say, look, we are not going to resolve all the human, uh, uh, disagreements among humans. We are going to record them as they are. Even today, material scientists are using ASM and ASTM vocabularies anyway, right? Now we are even em embodying them and we are, you know, putting them in the uh, computer's form and we are telling you how they were being used. So we have certainly made a progress without resolving the core disagreement between the humans uh, because there are two different communities, sub-communities that will not exactly come to the agreement. Thank you. Uh, Bob Wiggle from George Mason University. My pocket. Okay, thank you. So I'm here to talk about the current state and future challenges for search, access, and use of magnetospheric data. And so I'll give you a presentation that kind of parallels Joe German's uh, with regard to solar data. Um, so this is the outline. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and how I got into the, the data science domain. Um, and I'm also going to share, uh, based on my past eight years experience with virtual observatories and a lot of the uh, issues that are going on with EarthCube, I'll share some of my experiences and, and what I think are the themes for long-term success for projects like this. And then I'll give some feedback on the current state and future challenges of search, access, and use of uh, magnetospheric data primarily. And I'll revisit the themes, and then I, I have a wish list and some ideas. And I read through that survey. I was very happy to see that survey sent out. And I'll discuss some of the issues that were brought up in, in that survey, and I'll encourage it to be, that survey to be sent out to the broader community. Okay, so my background is that I started in 2006 as part of the uh, Computational Data Sciences Department at George Mason University. Um, we have a PhD program called Computational Science and Informatics, and I guess if the department was formed today, it would be the depart Department of uh, Computational Sciences and Big Data, and so the, <laughs> the ontology of, the, of that word is changing uh, uh, with time. Um, and so I started work on a virtual observatory, a, a radiation belt observatory, uh, in 2006, and since then I've been involved in many other NASA-supported uh, so-called heliophysics data environment projects since then, and here I'm just reminded of a question that was asked a few minutes ago where we're talking about language uh, across, across Europe and even within our, in our own community, NASA to NASA, it's heliophysics. And uh, this conference and this workshop refers to space physics. And so uh, these issues occur even within the boundaries. Okay, so some of the themes on the challenges for long-term success on uh, science data and science uh, software projects that I've observed over you know, the past uh, eight or 10 years. Uh, this is my list, and, and these are the things I, I hope to see uh, addressed. Uh, the first is community building. Um, in, in, at least in magnetospheric physics, it, we, have a more, we have a broader and more diverse community, and, and that kind of shows in the tools that we have to use. As, as a given scientist in my community uh, doesn't have access to 
software and a complete software package like he does uh, in solar science where uh, almost everything's encapsulated in so, the, the, uh, something like uh, SolarSoft or uh, SSW. Um, and so that's, that's a difficulty and, and we need to come up with ways to make spanning those boundaries more seamless. Um, another thing is with regard to uh, software projects uh, I've seen over the years is there are many different, um, different tools that are developed as part of cyber infrastructure process, as part of uh, cyber infrastructure projects, both in NASA and NSF. And these are typically funded on the time scale and with the model of how a science project is funded. And the problem with that is that uh, the half-life of the usefulness of software, science software, is only about a couple of years, whereas a science project that's funded by soft money uh, will usually lead to several publications which have relevance 10 to 20 years from now. And uh, one of the frustrating things as a scientist is to see really, really talented software engineers develop really nice things and then stop because they have to move on to another project and the project just, just sits and rots and decays. Okay, and another is awareness of incentives. I'll come back to that. And then there's the ever perennial software reuse issues. And I think, uh, I think Joe German mentioned, you know, breaking down these barriers is, is uh, a big key to the success of this in the long term. Okay, so on to the current state and future challenges. Um, I'll talk about the three different parts that we do. Um, the first is search, access, and use of magnetospheric data. And my understanding is, and based on uh, the survey and informal surveys of myself uh, and colleagues, is uh, the primary mechanism finding new data is from presentations, papers, and, and browsing familiar websites. And in about 2004, the Space Physics Archive Search and Extract Group was formed. And the idea was is to allow faceted search, to have a more organized way for people to find that data. And so that was about in uh, 2004. And I'll talk a little bit about, a little bit later, is that initially it was having to do with space physics archive, search and extract. Uh, but now primarily it's just the search and the extract part is not quite built into it yet. And where we are today is that we have a comprehensive list of data products. Uh, it's mostly comprehensive for the NASA-centric data products, but there's also pointers and markup and documentation of data products that are in the non-NASA world. And a number of virtual observatories use the space metadata uh, on the back end for search. Okay, so that's the uh, sort of the achievements that we have today with regard to search. And this is the uh, metadata model. And I think that the previous speaker mentioned that his advice was to go with a, a, something that's lightweight. Uh, this was back in 2004 and 2005. And we tried to do something that was very, very comprehensive. And not surprisingly, it took a long time. But our data model is fairly complete. And the way we describe data products is comprehensive enough that it captures and, and can capture almost all of the existing data that we found out there. Um, and so these are the different top level nodes. There's display data. So you know, somebody dumps a bunch of images on a, uh, on a file system. We can capture that. Uh, numerical data, which is what we all want. Uh, documents, documentation related to data. Granule, which is which means that just different files. So if you have uh, data stored in different files uh, on an HTTP or FTP server, this can point to the individual pieces. Uh, and then we have instruments and observatories, which house the instruments, and a registry repository service and annotation. Okay, and so this is the, the top level nodes that we've all agreed upon. And there's been a consortium that included international partners that uh, participated in this. And the primary uh, people working on this is the, uh, a group out of uh, UCLA, UCLA led by Todd King and also uh, Aaron Roberts at uh, uh, NASA. And, uh, there, but, but there's also many different domain scientists that participated to developing the way we describe and the vocabulary for these different things. And so there, this is a, a drill down view of that folder for numerical data. There's, each data product has to have a resource ID, resource header, access information, temporal description, when it starts, when it stops, and so on. So it looks like the problem's quite solved, right? <laughs> well, in a sense it is. 
we've solved the top level problem, which is we have a catalog, and I think uh, you know, there's somebody that likes to use the term of developing a ca card catalog for the inventory of heliophysics data. And we've done that. And then the question is, is now what? And this is the kind of thing you can do, is you can do a faceted search, provided there's enough information in the metadata that somebody bothered to write that information in. So I can say, give me all uh, data related to magnetometers over this time range um, in this spatial region. You can do, do very, very fine-grained searches. Uh, as we all know, uh, doing a fine-grained search like that is not frequently done, in part because the metadata doesn't exist for it. It hasn't been created. Uh, here's another more simple problem is that uh, you know, we have this metadata and it's all populated. And so if I do a search on Sunspot, I get a list of about 20 or 30 different links. And then my immediate question is, which one? How are they related? Which one should I use? And of course, there's some technology out there that's been developed in the computer science world to address that. But uh, we, we haven't quite got there yet. And, and that's, that's part of the reason is, is that first you have to have the metadata there. OK, so they, I think the biggest challenges with regard to metadata is that we have to avoid database decay. Uh, scientists are notorious for changing file names, changing file locations, changing URLs, and so on. And so there needs to be better ways of automated creating of this metadata. Uh, the virtual observatories and the people creating all of this space metadata typically did it manually. And we did it kind of in the wrong way, unfortunately. A lot of it had, a lot of it involved copying, pasting of readme files and information that was out there on the web by third parties, people that weren't involved with the data that, but, but kind of knew about the data. And that's how that metadata was created. And it was an ad hoc way of doing things. But in order for this to last, we need to address that issue. I think we need to simplify creation. Uh, that was one of the biggest challenges, uh, in part because that metadata model is it's pretty complex. And I gave the task of creating space to many different people. And they all had different interpretations of at what level and what depth. And the creation of that is just quite difficult. And I think if we're going to enable this faceted search and a lot of these uh, semantic web technologies, uh, it needs to be easier for scientists to create that metadata. Um, and I think there needs to be just simply bettering of narrowing of search results. I think there's tools out there that will allow us to, instead of just dumping out a list, a list of links uh, to tell us, for example, what's most popular. Um, I think there also needs for this, this project to kind of continue to take on a life of its own and, and continue to have relevance is that there needs to be motivation for the creation of space records. Um, we talked about uh, earlier, uh, one of the speakers mentioned that a lot of people will create their own data products, their, their own derived data products. And you know, maybe they'll put a readme out there and they'll put it on some file system. And it's very, very valuable, but it goes into that 99.5% of data that never gets looked at in part because nobody can find it. And so if, if there's a motivation to create these records because it'll, their, their data products are going to show up in search, uh, it keeps the system evolving and it keeps it relevant. Um, and uh, another kind of practical issue with this, with this technology is that we need, to be, we need to deal with the inconsistencies in the way that conventions were applied. We spent a lot of time developing the, the, the data model, the words and vocabularies that we used. Um, but we didn't talk much about what you put in those fields and how you put it, in, how you put it in. And so the, the, the database that we have is a little bit uneven in that sense, is that uh, some people have tons of information and some people have very little information. And so uh, it needs to be revised in order to stay relevant. OK, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, Issues of access. And I'll talk about two things. One is the uh, virtual observatories and uh, where that is and how things have evolved over the past uh, decade or so. And then I'm, I'm going to talk about a specific project that I was involved in to enable uh, access. And so essentially, I was, I was a scientist and I had a common data access use pattern. And I said, I shouldn't be doing this. There should be some software uh, or software out there that, that does this for me. And so I was involved in a project that attempted to 
uh, make the life easier for the scientists, and at the same time, enable one to do uh, large-scale uh, data analysis um, on time series like data. And so I'll talk about both of those aspects. Uh, it was already mentioned that there, we started out with uh, domain-specific virtual observatories, wave, radiation belt, magnetosphere, uh, solar, heliosphere, energetic particle, ionosphere, and there was also a model repository, uh, which essentially uh, was an interface for all of the simulation data that's out there. And again, the, the, at the very first level, it's intended to be a front end to domain specific resources, uh, especially for search. Uh, and, and as I said, many of, the, uh, many of these domains have interfaces where you can search across phase record. In the case of Radiation Belt Observatory, um, I, I don't present, uh, at least very easily, search results via space because most of the, the domain is small enough that most of the data products can be captured in uh, just an organized list as opposed to having a user drill down and click 10 times to find something. They can just scan a couple pages. Um, and in retrospect, uh, at the time of in inception, the access problem still existed, which really limited the virtual observatories and, and what we could do. Um, and these were the three challenges that had to be overcome. The first was developing the metadata, not only and writing the metadata and also developing the metadata model. And I think back in you know, 2004, this was maybe five years after Tim Berners-Lee's uh, Tim Berners uh, article, we kind of thought that XML was kind of magic, pixie dust, that could do things for us. And we thought, well, we'll just develop the metadata, and then uh, number two will follow. And of course, we, we kind of learned the hard way, hard way is that making those interconnections is very, very difficult. And it's a whole project in itself, a whole, whole process and project in itself. And then the third piece is uh, building and sustaining a user community. Um, that's, again, a very, very difficult challenge is that you can have a resource that's quite useful, but you have to build up a community. You have to convince the community that this resource is probably going to take on a life of its own after the funding cycle is over and uh, find a, way of, find a way, way of making that happen. And so I, I just saw in the uh, Space Physics and Aeronomy newsletter, the recent NASA draft plan regarding virtual observatories is, I'll just read it, uh, is that the discipline-specific VOs work very well for establishing and implementing a data model for a data product description and registry, <clears throat> but not, have not been as successful in providing transparent access to wide ranges of uh, data. And so the, the draft plan is to consolidate these activities into one entity and to emphasize more standards for description, formatting, and rather than uh, building more for portals. And I think I saw that, that reflected a little bit in some of the feedback on and the survey uh, in which said things seem to be scattered all over. And things are scattered all over in part because we have you know, a large diversity of virtual observatories. We, we also have a large diversity of universities and various other entities uh, that have data that's useful. And there's not uh, really a way to synthesize that all together. Hopefully Earth Cube. EarthCube will solve that. <laughs> okay, and so the, the, the next piece is, the, I started working on this, uh, this time series database project um, because I saw with the virtual observatories is that there was no way for us to easily access time series through an API. Uh, at present, in the magnetosphere community, a lot of the access is through file systems. And APIs are sometimes available uh, but the community has been slow to adopt them. And there's one reason is, is that many APIs have limitations that force users back to the file system. And so you can, you can access data through a URL, download it in various different formats, but if you try and go past two days of data, maybe you crash the server on the back end, or maybe there's a limit that only allows you to do one day of data at a time, so you have to do 100 file accesses. And these kind of limitations force users back to the file system. And the other reason is that science databases are quite different than those used in computer science. And uh, this is kind of required reading for our, our students that take the scientific databases uh, type courses is that uh, th this was back in 2004, Jim Gray of Microsoft Research and uh, uh, Salze from uh, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, wrote a paper on, on their experiences uh, with the computer science um, 
interacting with the astronomers. And I, I always point people to this when, I, when they ask me, why, why do you, you scientists, you know, kind of back in the Stone Age with regard to databases, you know, there's no SQL, there's MySQL and all of these different standards, why don't you just use these? And this paper kind of explains that. And I also point it to scientists who say, why is data access so hard? <laughs> Amazon is easy. Um, okay, so then a common model, at least initially, for access of data through the virtual observatories was to enter a date range and a parameter and get a list, that, a list of files that would need to be processed. And my feeling was, and sort of the motivation for this pro project was, that's not that much different than just kind of pointing me to a directory and just kind of mirroring the directory, pulling down what I need. And so um, uh, that was the model of the virtual observatories, and that's part of the reason we developed metadata that had different time ranges and pointed to different granules was to enable that kind of thing. But the user feedback was uh, typically that, that that's not really what they wanted. Um, I think Terry Onsager was the one that said back in, just when I was starting the virtual observatories, I was talking to him about this, and he said, I just want you to fill my array. You know, I'm sitting in IDL, I'm looking at a lump of data, I don't really care about the technology that's going, going in between there, and I don't need to learn um, you know, new programming languages just to start doing the analysis of the data. I understand it, and I know where it is, just, just put it in memory. Um, and then again, when I surveyed some people, uh, just informally, prior to this talk, they said, you know, we want to do machine learning and large-scale statistical studies, which is uh, kind of my field, is typically look at a solar cycle or more of, of data. And the issue is always is that you have to deal with many different file systems and many different uh, database, essentially database schema, just because of where the data are stored. They're not all stored in a nice NASA repository. Some of the useful data is just out there at university sites or various instrument sites. And so we want, we want an easy access route to that. Okay, so this is the, the project. And just to succinctly stated, it's to allow any data provider with a pile of files uh, of time series like data to have an instant API to their data. Uh, and the, the idea was is that we only have to fill out catalog level information that kind of describes how that data are stored. And so the challenge for us was to come up with okay, how do we come up with a general way of describing you know, the 50 or 100 different data files, data systems that are out there, de describing that in metadata? That was one piece. And then this, the second was the technology piece. As, as I said, it's, it's pretty easy to do this. Time series data are, are pretty simple, and you can you know, throw up a Perl script and start dumping data. But again, it, as somebody who's used a lot of these interfaces, you quickly run into the fact that uh, these interfaces, have, the APIs have limitations and you're crashing other people's servers and you just go back to the files. And so we had to solve that kind of software engineering problem as well. Um, yeah, and so we had to overcome the scaling, both the scaling and the generalization limitations. Okay, again, it was originally, this, in terms of the, the project, and, and this is kind of a, my experience with projects in cyber infrastructure that I'm sharing here, uh, different perspectives as to what worked and what didn't work is it was originally proposed as part of the virtual radiation belt observatory and then it was later supported as a standalone project it was, it was a very big project complicated project in itself uh, we're, we're at the end of the life uh, for the project and these were the goals <clears throat> what we claimed we were going to do is interface to five or more large data holdings we've done that we've interfaced it to uh, a 10 or 15 different data holdings, and so it's, the description of it is flexible enough that it does what we want. Uh, to allow for arbitrary time ranges, so in other words, if you want to pull down the solar cycle worth of one minute data, it will allow you to do that. Um, now, and, and to do that it requires a lot of uh, technology on the back end, and the technology that we developed kind of parallels what was done with things like Hadoop and MapReduce, where you know, all of the data are pulled pull down to whatever, wherever the server is that's doing the analysis. It could be to a user's desktop. Uh, this runs on, on a desktop as well. Pulls it all down in parallel and, and in parallel does the processing manipulation and then stitches it all together. Um, and then it does simple things like averaging and, and so on. And so this was sort of my specification that I gave to the, the people that were working on this is that 
you know, I have, here's uh, USGS maintaining some real-time data. I want to look at it, and I want to look at, say, like a year of data and say at all of the 10 or 20 different stations that they have. I see some patterns there, you know, the timestamps and the way it's labeled, and that's all I really need to know. And now I could write 100 lines of IDL or MATLAB, you know, custom parser for all of that, but I really know that only those four bits of information are needed in order for me to fill my array. And so the requirement that I had was that uh, this is the information that, you know, the scientist or the user would enter um, or would be pre-configured for them. And then from that, you would have, just with that simple configuration, you could have a simple interface uh, where it just has drop-down menus of the different parameters and the time ranges, and then link backs to the original data source, original data sources, um, and then information about the, the, the data set that, at, at what you're getting. And so this is, we, we tried to keep the, the interface very lightweight. Uh, I, I think, as was mentioned before, we don't really like web interfaces sometimes that much and uh, many of them are over-designed. And so this is just uh, sort of a simple way to look at what, what's available. What you really want is a URL. And so, uh, with, oops. Uh, so it uses this REST style URL where you specify a catalog data set parameter, uh, start and stop time, and then you just get, you just get a data dump. And so you can, you can look at the data dump, and then if you append PNG, it'll give you a simple preview plot. And again, we didn't try to do anything too fancy because most of the time people just want the data in their own system and their own analysis. But sometimes it's useful to have a preview. And then finally, to achieve that fill my array, which is something I really wanted, it was just better stated by Terry, was I just want to copy and paste this in here. And this is a, like a six line script that will pull data down. In this case, it's pulling it down in ASCII, but there's a fast mode where it pulls it down in binary copy and paste this in, pulling the, downloading the data, putting it in my array, and then, and then I'm done. And um, so this is, this is where we left it. Um, well, I'll just give you a little bit of a history of this, because it's, it, it's kind of a the progress of a scientist learning computer science. Uh, the initial version was just a series of batch scripts that I was using my, in my own analysis. And I just generalized them a little bit so we didn't have to do that much change when I looked at different data systems. Um, of course, that's the, kind of the scientist way of doing that, and uh, it's not a good long-term solution. Uh, but it did allow for some uh, very, very fast serving of data. So if you, you pre-create these long, uh, you know, pre-caching, essentially, really, really long sets of data, uh, you can make HTTP requests for like subsets of that data or do averaging on subsets of that data very, very quickly. And so this allows us to look at you know, very, very large data sets over different multiple scales because you can, we also cache the different averages. Uh, but again, this was uh, not a good long term, wasn't really a robust solution. Um, next we looked at OpenDAP threads, uh, the OpenDAP threads NCML stack, so that's out of uh, NCAR. And that, that software, so it's open da data access pro protocol, threads is a, a metadata model dealing with uh, how you sort of a top level description of, diff of different um, resources. And then NCML is a way of describing kind of the contents of a file, initially for a NetCDF file, but it can also describe contents of uh, other types of files. And we spent a very, very long time on this. In retrospect, I think what, what, what happened was uh, this kind of had all of the elements but it was developed for a database and for people looking at data that was typically on a latitude longitude grid. And so again, this goes back to the database problem is that um, the different data structures really, really require very different databases. So if you're looking at mostly a few time steps or you know, a couple days of time steps worth of lat long data, that requires a completely different, almost a completely different set of software uh, tools and database tools than it would be for like a time series database. And you know, we also talked about um, you know, the case where you have streams of data, 150 megabits per second. That's, that's a completely different problem. And unfortunately, the, the computer scientists haven't worked out all of those different use cases and developed the equivalent of an SQL or a NoSQL for those use cases. Um, and so we abandoned this after, um, uh, after some time, and the latest version is in uh, it's uh, JavaScript and a little bit of C, and, it, and it's pretty lightweight. And 
So we're working with several data providers for use. And these are the challenges. Uh, personally, I, th I think that it's still kind of complicated to create catalogs. This is almost to the point of a tool where that I would use, you know, personally, uh, is, as I would download the software and, and fill out a template and use this instead of writing my custom script. But until it's to that point, I think it's, it's not quite done. Um, and I think we also need to develop a standard for uh, the catalog schema. And so, as I said, Spaze is primarily for search. Initially, it had been envisioned for extract, but uh, we didn't really develop the description of how you annotate and describe different resources that have numbers. You, we just had kind of pointers to where the numbers live. And there wasn't enough information in there for automated processing by computers to figure out how to ingest the data and manipulate it and to put it on grids and so on. And so that part of it needs to be put into space. Uh, that's, that's always been, in my mind, something that was lacking is that most of the space metadata is for consumption by humans in, instead of machines. And I think more automation is always better. And, and I think we need community buy-in for data products, providers, users, and software developers. And as I said, we're at the, sp at the point where at, we kind of achieved all the successes of our, of our project. And uh, the question is, is now what? And so, you know, we're trying to build a community, but we need, there needs to be developers and, uh, you know, software to continue on needs either money or these three things. And uh, again, money isn't always the answer and money isn't always available. Um, and then just kind of a few specific thing, very technical detail. Um, one of the things that enables this thing to work very well is, as, as I said, it does parallel downloading and parallel processing. Um, now, when you have data that's on a remote system, what, you, what it'll do is it'll say, well, you want to do this processing job, and we all know that database queries are very, very expensive computationally. And so it'll check to see if it needs to redo that query. And if not, it'll just send you the, to a data, data set that's more local that's equivalent to what would happen if you reprocessed everything. Now, that's fine for file system type databases, but what I find is that uh, there's many data services out there that won't tell you um, the age of the data. And so you, you query for data, and uh, you query the next day for data, and you don't know if you have to re-download the data because there's no, there's no information in the headers that tell you about that. And I also think there needs to be uh, a logging interface, I think, to sort of as incentive for the data providers is that it, it needs to you know, be really easy for them to develop metrics. Um, and the usual way of developing metrics is, is asking some guy to parse some Apache logs. And so if that was a part of it, it would be a useful feature. Okay, so <clears throat> we're doing our time. Um, the, the last piece is use. And so I'll go through this somewhat quickly. The three primary data types in the magnetosphere are, uh, as I said, time series, uh, images on a lat long grid, grid, and 3D simulation output. Um, and this, so, so with time series, I think this is reflected in the survey, as people uh, have enough tools to, uh, to be able to import it and, and, and use it. Um, and so the use isn't as much of a problem as it is for, say, like simulation model output where you have to figure out how things are gridded. With this, this kind of data, data, there's not that issue. I, I think the biggest challenge in my mind is how to communicate and share specialized and derived data sets. Uh, there are many scientists that will either publish papers or uh, create a data set that, has, that everybody's kind of doing on their own to enable their own analysis. And they'll just do it once and validate it and uh, build confidence in it and publish it. And the question is, is how does that get shared with com the community? And the examples of that are, uh, I think, you know, there's people that look at long time histories of the solar wind velocity upstream of the magnetosphere. Uh, the data have gaps, and somebody's come up with a clever algorithm for filling in those gaps in a meaningful way. And how does that get shared? That thing has ad added value, but it doesn't, it doesn't really fit into any data system that exists because, you know, you have the, the large NASA data centers, and, uh, and at least what we did is with virtual observatories would host these, you know, very small specialized data sets. But, but again, that's sort of a stopgap measure. Uh, the, the issue of communication is, is also as big. Again, if we're not using 99.5% of the data, these people that are creating these data sets need to find a better way to share it. Uh, writing a publication is fine, but also having some sort of system or infrastructure by which 
that can be propagated through and communicated more easily would be useful. Um, in terms of use, we look at images on lat long uh, grids. So this is high latitude ionosphere, uh, aurora, particle precipitation map um, measured by a satellite. And then we have uh, radars measuring, um, I think there's some radar people here, uh, uh, radars measuring uh, flows in the ionosphere. And you know, there's a big emphasis, at least in the geospace environment modeling, on system science. So they say, well, you, know, you magnetosphere guys need to work with the ionosphere people who need to work with the thermosphere and figure out how it's all coupled. Well, there's two problems. One is understanding the physics of all of those, those different things. And then the second is putting those data together, because each of these different domains, thermosphere, ionosphere, magnetosphere, have developed their different conventions and ways of looking at data. And I think what limits us in many cases is the fact that uh, putting all of that data together is difficult. And most of the time, when you see somebody that's done a study, behind the scenes is some very, very talented student or software engineer that's dealt with this problem, combining these, two, these data from these different domains. Uh, and then finally, 3D simulation output, uh, primary tools, software-wise. Uh, there's something called the, C the Community Coordinated Modeling Center. And what they've done is they've taken the job of compiling and executing the models out of the hands of the users. You can, do the, you can do these runs without having to figure out all of the configuration and compilation issues uh, and execute the runs. And then they also have a, a web interface. Uh, and as we all know, web interfaces can be somewhat limiting. And I think um, one thing that's needed is oops, uh, easier intercomparison of these models and direct use of data and the, to the allowing image overlays. And again, uh, the, there's many web tools that will do this for you. But in the end, uh, it's useful to have a software library and a tool that allows you to do it on your own system and on your own. Because de developing just a generalized web tool that's going to do everything for every scientist, every scientist is inexpensive and uh, unrealistic. OK, so back to these themes. Um, these, mentioned the issue of community building um, and consideration of software maintenance and the half-life of software you know, being one or two years of it being useful and the, the, the model of supporting innovations in the cyber infrastructure might not be uh, the same model that you want to use for supporting innovation in uh, just regular science. Uh, keeping awareness of incentives, I'll come back to that in a second here, and s the perennial software reuse thing. And so here's my brief wish list, the things that I wish I had. Um, this one has a dual purpose. Uh, you know, w when I submit a journal article, it'd be really nice if I said, well, I use these five data sets. If I just had an interface on the article web page where it would just say, I use these data sets, and then it would kind of fill in the attributions of how these data providers want to be attributed. And I don't have to go hunting for it on the web and possibly finding broken links and dead links. Um, so it makes my job easier, but it also solves this other problem of the creation of meta metadata. Is in the past, it's been you know, virtual observatories or different individuals doing it, but we need to find a way for people who really know the information to be populating these metadata databases. And so this, this would provide incentive to uh, data providers to kind of participate in that, is if they know that it's more likely that uh, th their data will be cited in the proper way if uh, they're participating. And I think there needs to be better coupling of proposals and papers with the metadata databases. And again, this is the experience with creating space records. It's expensive and it's very difficult, and in part because there's not enough tools, in part just not enough of it's being created. And it would be nice if there was some sort of coupling so that when you write a paper or you do a proposal that produces some sort of data product, the space record falls out of it. And so now we have a record of it, and it's in, it's in the, the so-called card catalog. Um, <clears throat> I think more integrated tools, there's a tool called uh, Chameleon, which is, takes uh, the output from uh, three or four or five different simulations models in, in magnetosphere and solar wind and puts it on a co common time grid and allows you to do interpolation. And I think the non-existence of a tool like that is what uh, prevents people from 
you know, just looking at data from different simulations because just because that tool doesn't exist and it takes a, a long time to write. And I think uh, libraries like this as opposed to more web interfaces are useful. Now again, the problem with this is that you know, developing a software library, it's, it's not, doesn't really sell. It's hard to write a proposal or get funded for something that is going to read data and interpret, interpret, uh, interpret, uh, interpolate grids and so on. It's really hard to get that supported. But in terms of the science impact, it's huge because once we have this science tool, it saves, uh, it saves us from having to uh, write the software ourselves or, again, never do it. And I, I've always thought that we need this large-scale user survey. Um, uh, Joe said that graduate students are the ones that thank him the most. And it's been my anecdotal experience that a, a lot of the decisions that are made about cyber infrastructure and how things should be done uh, tend to be made by people who aren't really necessarily the users, just to say, this is how it should be done because this is how I do it. And I, I think that can lead to many different problems, uh, of course. And I think having a large-scale user survey like, like the one that was sent out and really getting the data would be useful. And so we don't have to say, uh, design things for one particular use, user who has a very loud voice. <laughs> um, I think, oops, I think workshops like these are useful. Cross-disciplinary software, uh, I think that needs to be discussed. Many of the problems that we have, you know, we have data structures, we have image data, time series data, and 3D data. All of these different earth science domain users have these different um, data structures that we deal with, and there needs to be cross-cutting tools that are developed by all the different communities. What it's been thus far is that it'll be one community that developed a tool for themselves and kind of try to make it cross-cutting, but sometimes it always, doesn't always go you know, the, the full distance. And finally, I think there needs to be better international and uh, interagency collaboration um, on cyber infrastructure-related projects is that uh, you know, the, we have different institutions that are participating in, for example, the space metadata model and virtual observatories. Uh, but there is a tendency to, to kind of silo things. And knocking down those barriers will lead to life being a lot easier in the future. Uh, but I don't have a solution for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Bob, one of the things I, uh, I guess I don't have a good feel for is uh, um, space is good. Space is good for data, but um, has the modeling community uh, adopted that? And are are you know, for geospatial models? Do they fit well into a metadata standard? Uh, they are starting to. They, um, the, the simulation group and the simulation arm of this has started participating and developing a uh, a way of describing simulation resources, uh, and so that's. Yeah, the, the geospatial aspect. But it just, just started a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and I think space was the way it was designed and developed was to allow these hooks to be met, added into it. Yeah. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback off of that last question, um, one of the limitations of CCMC implementing space is that it didn't really translate well to, uh, you know, the 3D grids that we have, but the ImpX, uh, activity out of Europe, they've piggybacked directly off of, of space and they've done all, all of the hard work. And so they've defined everything that we've always wanted. And so it's just a matter of us implementing uh, space plus MX into our data holdings. And I think that uh, will be very useful for the community. Yeah. Thank you. You're next. I guess he gets to decide he has the microphone. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just a quick question. If, if um, just you know, go go all the way back to when you started this project. Um, you, you put a, a huge amount of effort into gathering this this um, metadata. I was just wondering how much more of an effort you think it would have been if you had changed the project slightly and decided, well, I want to gather metadata and I find out enough about the files so that I can take all these data sources and import into a standardized data format, and it might have solved some of your access problems. Do you think that would have been a much bigger problem or yeah, if, if you could go back in time and, and redo that, would you, yeah, would you reconsider? Uh, intellectually, I think it, it would have been doable, but I think uh, going back in time, it was a largely, you know, said maybe 75% a group of scientists that really didn't know about this stuff. XML was kind of new to, to, to them, and I think it would have taken a lot longer. Um, 
And, and I think the, uh, the experiences that we've had in developing that, uh, you know, the search part of it, sort of made this new development part a little bit easier. But yeah, I, that, that was the initial plan, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, this, uh, I'm from one of the instrument teams on SDO. And mm -hmm. so you mentioned about the data rate, uh, like mm -hmm. how to deal with this um, when you have such a large data rate. And the way um, HMI and AI dealt with it is to, to have um, all the metadata um, separate in an SQL database mm -hmm. so that people can do the queries on, on the data. So that the, the metadata would then include not just uh, the times and the positions or whatever, but also um, like a, uh, the total intensity or, right. or percentile. So you can do light curves without actually getting the files. So, and then there's the, all the API functions that allow you to essentially just query the, the keywords and that's like getting a time series right. um, from an SQL directly just via a web interface. Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that is working pretty well. So, so people can look at these keywords first using um, e essentially the API front end for the SQL queries and then they decide whether to, to get the files or not. And, and, and so, so this two-step process I think has worked very well for, for, for this large data volume. Do you find that, uh, you know, I, I find that users will often just short circuit the interface that tells them the subset of data they need and just mirror everything. But I guess you have the problem that it's impossible, right? And so mm -hmm. users are really forced to use this interface to be a little bit more selective. Uh, yes, they, they basically, um, well, I think they can get other files through other venues like through VSO. But um, if they want to get it through the, the JSOC, which is the right. data ser center serving the SDO, uh, the HMI and AI data, then they have to do it through this two-step process. Uh, well, hmm. they, can, they can do it in one step, but it doesn't make sense for them to do it anyway, so they learn very quickly. Um, <coughs> Bob, thanks very much. That was a great talk. Um, I have a general question for you, and pr pretty much for the whole room, I think this is something that maybe we can all weigh in on. Uh, to do with your point on data usage, and maybe part of the wish list, yeah. I think for me personally, part of my wish list is that we would all as a community agree on a common language to use, because you see different communities, and they sort of start developing a whole set of tools and IDL, and there's another group that goes off and does Python stuff. And you think, you know, if we could just, uh, agree on a language um, on the front end and just develop all the libraries ahead of time. I don't know if this is pie in the sky and could never ever happen, but uh, maybe it would be nice to think about it. I don't know. Um, anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, Marla. <laughs> you know, so the approach we've taken is to, um, like Chameleon, for example, that Bob mentioned, it's essentially a, a library that provides access to uh, 3D simulation data, and so it was originally written in C, uh, it evolved into C++, but our idea is that as long as it's some high-level programming language with a very straightforward interface that you can call it from pretty much any language that you program in. So the, the main problem is just the metadata, describing the information that's in the data files and providing an interface to allow you to quickly access that data. And if you have to make three calls to a library to open a file, interpolate and close the file. It's not too much effort. Um, the hard part is describing the data and, and developing the library and the interface. Um, I don't think we'll ever agree on a single language, actually. Yeah, I, th I tend to agree on that. I think it's, it's too late. Uh, some communities, that's kind of developed in, like, let's say, the statistics community, where everybody uses R and contrib contributes to that one language. And uh, to some extent, IDL and some of the, the space physics community but uh, it's at this point that, that diversity is just, just too large, and I think it's better just to have back-end libraries and whatever the flavor of the day is for languages um, uh, can use it. I want to ask you about the future, based, based on your experience with, with this project. How far are we from the, from the scenario when modeler can basically grab his model and go to the database and search for the 10 nearest neighbors of this particular mo model based on the similarity search. Seems there's lots of works done on the actual SQL-based databases here when you primarily use the range data queries, right? Mm -hmm. Why about KNN queries? Why about the 
information retrieval like queries, right? When I'm going to Google, I'm not getting exact research, I'm looking for similar research. Right. How far are we from this stage? I, I think very far. <laughs> uh, in, in part because uh, I think the, the software that would enable it doesn't exist, and then metadata th that would allow it also doesn't exist. And I, however, I've seen people develop interfaces like that that can kind of do those things, but it's always on an ad hoc basis. Um, and developing a generalized tool, gosh, would be wonderful. But uh, I think uh, we have to deal with these other kind of lower level, more basic problems first. Uh, yep. Hi, Bob. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to make a comment about um, some of the things that have been said on this particular question, which is that, you know, the development of common uh, language or whatever. It's not really about the languages. What really matters is the common standard data language or data dictionary like we have with space, but more importantly, the standardized interfaces. Because if we can really define a standard set of interfaces, a standard set of common language that goes with those interfaces, then we can write whatever we want to query into those common interfaces. And that's, I think, where your next biggest uh, hurdle is going to be coming over is understanding what that interface language is going to be. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, was, if, I guess if I was Jim Gray from Microsoft Research and I had the money, a project I would support would be similar to what was done with NetCDF and HDF5, which is they did exactly that. And I would say, okay, let's do this with CDF uh, and FITS and, and just, do, just get it done. And we don't have to deal with all of these different file formats. We just have to deal with that one interface. Um, I, again, that's kind of like the Chameleon project is that it's uh, not something that really sells. <laughs> and find, Finding somebody to do it is one thing, and uh, getting s somebody to do it and finding the support for them to do it is, is a very difficult task. But I wish it was done, yeah. Let's thank our speaker. And <laughs> thank you.